Good afternoon, Honorable Chancellor, sir. Where Prakash?
good afternoon good afternoon uh, sirs good afternoon to honorable chancellor ved prakash mishra ji sir and good afternoon to alra sir this is professor dr r kannan from the department of general surgery of mahatma gandhi medical college who would like to welcome all our senior senior most faculty and uh, who have joined us uh, on this particular day we have with us professor pratik bohete ma'am who is the community medicine hod from Sat sri satya sai medical college and research center which is one of the constituent unit of our sri balaji vidyapeeth puducherry pratik ma'am the board is yours thank you sir uh, hello everyone and good afternoon to all uh, our uh, eminent resource persons as well as all of the participants myself uh, dr pratik bohate professor and head of department of community medicine at sri satya sai medical college and research institute a constituent unit of sri balaji vidyapeeth team to be university puducherry welcome all of you for today's uh, national webinar on the topic of national health mission and overview national health mission was launched on the april 2005 government of india to address the various health needs of underserved rural areas and with the launch of uh, national urban health mission in 2013 its scope was expanded further to encompass even the urban and peri urban areas under a common nomenclature of national health mission the main focus of the mission is to establish uh, a fully functional community owned decentralized healthcare delivery system to tackle the various determinants of health uh such as water sanitation education nutrition etc so today we have uh, eminent speakers uh, to talk about the various aspects of national health mission and i am very much confident that after listening to their thoughts we will be quite uh, empowered in discharging our roles and responsibilities as health sciences universities towards accomplishment of this uh, mission on that note uh, let's move on to the first session of uh, today's webinar which is on the topic of uh, all about national health mission with emphasis on nrhm as well as uh, nuhm and for this we have a very apt person to talk about professor vedh prakash mishra sir honorable pro chancellor cum chief advisor of uh, datta mega institute of medical sciences a deemed to be university in nagpur sir is currently the national head of uh, academic program of indian uh, program of unesco chair of bioethics a dynamic orator he is a keen academician and a erudite administrator uh, he has been conferred with the highest uh... <coughs> hello am i audible sir Yes, you are audible. Am you are audible? Uh, sir, uh, has been conferred with the highest academic distinction of D. Conferred with DSC honor is co uh, caused by six health six health sciences universities in the country. His association with the Medical Council of India in various capacities has been of for over uh, three decades, where he held a prestigious position of the chairman of Postgraduate Medical Education Committee. he has the distinction of being recognized as professor emeritus professor of eminence and professor of excellence with five health science universities of the country he has been a pioneer in evolving post graduate degree courses curriculum as the chairman of post graduate medical education committee of the medical council of india new delhi as well as uh, in evolving of the integrated competency based undergraduate medical education curriculum i launched the course yaar faculty development program for the full full time teaching faculty of medical schools of the country he is the honorary advisor to national indian medical association and member of the standing committee for medical education with its headquarters at new delhi he is also a member of board of management governing council advisory uh, council at various renowned educational institutions including sri balaji vidyapeeth puducherry dr mishra is the recipient of well over 100 prestigious national and international awards at this point i would also like to mention that i had the privilege of being sir uh, student during my mbbs at uh, government uh, government medical college of nagpur so with this uh, it's over to you sir thank you very much ma'am for your kind good words my esteemed learned brother a tall academician and researcher 
लर्नेड वाइस चांसलर ऑफ श्री बालाजी विद्यापीठ डॉक्टर सुभाष परिजा esteemed panelist who shall be speaking in this webinar and a noted academician and astute administrator learned vice chancellor dr op kalra members of the teaching staff of the university and all those who are participating in this webinar my esteemed brother and friend dr kanan ladies and gentlemen at the outset i deem it my pleasure to record my sincere sense of appreciation for balaji vidyapeeth under the astute leadership of dr subhash parija to have taken lead in organizing this very meaningful webinar and more than that i want to record my appreciation thankfulness and gratitude to the university and the department of community medicine for organizing and putting across this theme for the purposes of discussion and deliberation recording my sense of compliments ladies and gentlemen my main purview which i am wanting to put across is the operational details in terms of the sub theme will be dealt will be dealt by my subsequent learned panelists why national health mission purport of national health mission rationale of national health mission and constitutional mandate for national health mission i am not embarking on the operational details but i am wanting to put across the edifice of this entire health program that has been launched ambitiously by the government of india ladies and gentlemen we are all aware that every international charter be it the charter worked out by league of nations be it the charter which has been worked out by uno be it the unesco charter of 2005 be it the sustainable developmental goals which we have evolved for the emancipation of the men and mankind one core underlying factor in all these chapters has in all these charters has been that health is a global right which has to be accruable to every citizen beyond any considerations of and demarcations deviations or distortions of any type the main em emphasis is the entitlement of health to every global citizen which turns out to be the core edifice of various states or governments contemplating the genuine extension of the same as a mark of actualization of that charter of right when i speak for your and my country it's no more a international dictum of being a global right 26th of january 1950 when we adopted the constitution of this great country of ours ladies and gentlemen in that under chapter 3 we guaranteed fundamental rights to every citizen in this country i am specifically drawing the attention of this learned gathering to article 21 of the said constitution of india where under under its chapter 3 from article 12 to article 32 fundamental rights stand defined and they are absolutely crystallized the learned supreme court on n number of occasions in n number of very meaningful and emphatic pronouncements has described and analyzed the scope and ambit of article 21 and the basic edifice in the context of which they explain the scope meaning and operation of it is that the constitution of india has embarked on itself for converting free india through the aegis of the government as a welfare state and therefore this is the cardinal dictum in the backdrop of which we need to understand the entire scope relevance meaning and mandate of national health mission what is welfare state ladies and gentlemen it has been defined in the constitution itself and more so it has been very clearly elucidated in the preamble of the constitution itself what for the constitution is enacted what for the reason it is adopted it is for the purposes of guaranteeing every citizen of free india in terms of guarantees pertaining to liberty equality fraternity and justice which have been echoed in terms of their operability in fundamental charter of 
articles beginning from 12, 12 to 32 in chapter 3, titled as Fundamental Rights. In this, why I am referring to Article 21, Honorable Supreme Court interpreting the scope and meaning of Article 21 categorically emphasized on n number of occasions that this guarantees right to life and liberty. But then, what are the contours of that life, that life and liberty guaranteed under Article 21 by the state to every citizen of this country and which is justiciable as well in case of any infringement thereon? It means two important prefixes with right to life and liberty means right to decent and dignified life. Decency and dignity, which is incorporated in terms of the guarantee. This has been crystallized in terms of an expert committee report constituted way back in 1952, which wanted to give the actualized dimensions as to what the welfare state means in the constitution and what would amount to actualization of welfare state. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm tempted to quote in that report, 18 parameters were identified, the actualization of which would result in translation of the welfare state as mandated in the Constitution of India. What were those 18 parameters? I'm listing only first and second rank parameters. Rest are not the part of my discussion today. Parameter number one, which has been listed as the key and cardinal parameter for actualization of welfare state is ensuring entitlement of right to health by every citizen in this country in the form of a constitutional guarantee as a part of actualization of the concept enshrined in the constitution of invocation of a welfare state, right to health and right to education. Criteria number one, right to health. Criteria number two, right to education. Therefore, I'm taking up these as the key and cardinal parameters which have been listed at serial number one and two in the entire list of 18 parameters catalogued there and done. When I'm emphasizing this, ladies and gentlemen, what it means, it means that health is a guarantee which is expected to be extended by the state as an instrumentality defined under the constitution as a part of its right extendable to every citizen. It is in this context, when we say national health mission, when we say national rural health mission, when we say national urban health mission, and when we say national rural health mission and national urban health mission as the two principal organs under the rubric of national health mission, what exactly it is? It, to me, it basically means that the ambit of Article 21, the contemplation of right to life and liberty, the contemplation of right to decent life, the decent and dignified life and liberty, the contemplation of actualization of welfare state, and among the actualization of welfare state, the most cardinal parameter being actualization and genuine extension of right to health to every citizen for the purposes of his or her decent and dignified living turns out to be a guarantee which is to be actualized. Therefore, my submission, which I'm wanting to put across with whatever little understanding I have at my disposal is that national health mission is a direct modality of actualization of the guarantee incorporated in the Constitution of India, echoed in Article 21, interpreted by the Honorable Supreme Court, in spite of the fact that right to health still explicitly is not worded under, under Chapter 3 of the Constitution of India, turns out to be a fundamental right which is accurable to every citizen. State as an organ, and state not in the form of the state as we conceive, state as an organ which is an instrumentality, statutory in nature, which is described in the constitution as appropriate government, be the central and the state government, therefore are duty bound and are committed to the constitutional mandate to actualize the welfare state. Therefore, they are required to ensure that right to legitimate expectation translated into a fundamental right of right to health is actualized under all situations and all circumstances to the citizens of this country. Therefore, it is the constitutional mandate, which is the mother repository of national health mission sponsored by the government of India in this country. Having said so, ladies and gentlemen, it is not that there was no purview which was hither to before the national health mission for the purposes of achieving this mission. There have been n number of efforts in n number of names which have been worked out. 
But one of the important aspects which I'm wanting to draw home is healthcare through public funding. And that is the instrumentality and onus which is responsible for actualization of the right. In this context, again, I'm back to 1952, when the first five-year plan was to be launched, the cardinal principles that were set up for the purposes of actualization of the developmental profile of the country towards ushering in of welfare state, budgetary allocation was depicted. And there were two important considerations which I wanted to focus, and they were that as health and education turned out to be the most cardinal parameters towards actualization of the same, therefore, Annually, a budgetary allocation of 6% of the gross domestic produce or gross national produce would be attributable and allocable to each arena, namely the health and the education, respectively. The priority, what I'm wanting to bring out is right from the inception of the planning process from 1952 in the country, the budgetary or the public funding which was expected to be generated and harnessed for the purposes of health was minimum. 6% of the gross domestic produce, as has been propounded there as a guideline for the purposes of public funding distribution. It is in this field, ladies and gentlemen, I would like all of us to appreciate the relevance and the significance of National Health Mission. When we contemplate launch of the National Health Mission, I am not touching the objectives of it, I am not touching the purport of it, as my learned brother, Dr. O.P. Kalra will be dealing with that in its address thematically because that is the theme which has been allocated to him. But generically speaking, what exactly National Health Mission talked about? The policy frame which has been put across in the preamble of National Health Mission makes something very interesting reading and makes the purport of it very loud and clear. It brings out, according to me, three or four important aspects which are required to be noted. Number one, in realistic actualization of right to quality health, and again, now I am here wanting to add one more prefix. It is the first document which is not just talking of right to health, it is talking of right to quality health care. It is not compromised health care, it is not as it is available a health care, but it is right to quality health care which according to me turns out to be an important dimension of national health mission. It means, it mandates, and the classical depiction that has been availed, I'm tempted to quote, universal access to. What do you mean by universal access? Universal access in the legal parlance as emanating from the constitution is, it is an access which is independent of 17 demarcations and distinctions which have been described in the constitution. And therefore, the word universal is not an adjective in national health mission policy. What is the ambit of that universality? It means entitlement and actualization of right to health to every citizen and that right in terms of extension of quality health care services beyond the considerations of gender, caste, creed, color, faith, belief, modality of worship, trade, calling, order, profession, vocation, and geographic location. And therefore, the distinction between urban as well as rural healthcare mission covering the entire geographical contour of this country to be extended without any deviation, without any demarcation, and without any distortion of any type. Every word in that particular declaration, ladies and gentlemen, has its germane association emanating from the provisions of the Constitution of India. Access to what? Healthcare. In terms of what? Three important prefixes have been used. That which is equitable in nature. Equitability is the hallmark. Therefore, the demarcation considerations depicted in the Constitution, they gain force in the sense it is a right which is equitable in character. Equity and equitability, therefore, turns out to be the cardinal face and facet of national health mission. The second aspect which has been described is, apart from being equitable, it has to be affordable. Affordability is the real hallmark of this country. Imagine the nature of the socio-economic demarcations and differentiations which exist. 
the impoverished buying capacity of the citizens of this country, the absolute plaguing of the poverty, which is the one of the most dominant situation. Therefore, what is the provision? The provision is it is it has to be affordable in nature. And third important dimension is in the name of affordability, it cannot be double standard compromise healthcare. It will be quality healthcare as applicable to tallest of the tall, so also to the weakest of the weak, so also to the remotest of the remote, and so also to the poorest of the poor. This is the ambit which I'm wanting to focus and signify in the context of national health mission. Further, the important dimension which has been put across is perhaps a newer, bigger vitality and interpretation of the integration and planning process in regard to the extension of healthcare, quality healthcare has been worked out in its statement itself, where it says that this will be modality worked out through rendering of the quality healthcare services that are, and again, I'm telling you two important prefixes that are responsive. Responsiveness here contemplates it is the responsibility which goes to indicate that as it is a right, it can be justiciable. Therefore, it has to be responsive. And yet another aspect which has been put across is it has to be accountable. It cannot be anarchic. It cannot be autonomous. It is accountable to whom? It is responsive and accountable to people's needs. Needs of the people of this country. A healthcare delivery system, a healthcare mechanism, to be taken up as a health extension mission, which is guaranteeing the, the health extension of the healthcare services, which are absolutely will be worked out in an equitable manner, which will be absolutely affordable and which will be absolutely quality centric and will be worked out in a modern manner, which will be responsive and accountable in nature and character. And this responsiveness and accountability will be constantly to, the, to be matching with the people's needs of this country. They have used yet another word, although in the formulation, the word said is need, but in the description, yet another word which has been tagged with the need is needs and aspirations of the people. These are not prefixes and hollow additions, ladies and gentlemen. They mean substantially. It is not only that the felt need of the people, but expectations out of that need in terms of perceptions and those perceptions which are the aspirations, even they stand covered along with the needs. It is not just acute felt need, but it is needs and aspirations, expectations, which also are required to be covered in a responsive and an accountable manner. Another dimension which is equally important when we talk of the National Health Mission in its prologue and preamble is that the modality which will be structured, it will have certain specific features and what will be. It will be fully functional in terms of it being community owned, owned by the community and owned by the community is not the proprietorship. Community ownership is participation of the community there at and it would be decentralized in nature. It would not be a centralized program and therefore, this is, again, I'm saying National Health Mission absolutely is truly in terms of the spirit incorporated in the constitution of federalism because health in this country of mine under the schedule appended to the constitution is not a central subject, it is not a subject included in the concurrent list. Health is a state subject and therefore the participation of states incorporation of states with their rights, responsibilities, and equitable participation is the hallmark of national health mission, which mandates that this will be absolutely with totalistic participation and involvement of various states and union territories in this country. It is in that context, the spirit of federalism Another important is honored. Another important dimension which I would like to work, work out is the entire execution will be in terms of intersectoral congruence. Now, this is another important, the planning part, the execution part, which has been mandated in the National Health Mission has invoked a really new and novel approach where it mandates that it will be worked out by intersectoral congruence and most important aspect, which I think, which is the soul of National Health Mission is to impact what? 
It is not just quality healthcare services in the curative domain or promotive domain to impact the social determinants of this country. And that is exactly the actualization of welfare state. It is not just a, a morsel, a dose of medicine being extended. It is alteration of the social determinants of this country for the purpose of giving a real-time benefit of what we call as legitimate entitled to health in terms of theory propounded by Dr. Michael Marmot of social determinants where a, a, where a vicious circle is described. Impoverished society. Compromised levels of health and hygiene will result in causation of the disease will result in cost, will result in out-of-pocket expenses, which will add to the poverty. And that added poverty will again become going in for generation of greater quantum of disease of wide ranges. And therefore, poverty and disease in terms of impoverished social determinants, they go to constitute a vicious circle which can be broken only by altering the social determinants of the society. And therefore, National Health Mission is not just a dose of medicine put at the doorsteps of the citizens of this country for the purposes of curative dimension of their ailment, but it is something more wide, more vivid. It is more telescopic in character, where it contemplates that this particular vicious circle. This particular vicious circle will be breached by alteration of social determinants and they have taken five important parables which I think are most vital in terms of sanitation, in terms of potable water, in terms of health education, in terms of nutrition and in terms of social and gender equality. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, having gone through this preamble very critically, Having looked into the genesis of this preamble in terms of the constitutional provisions of this country, whatever little I've been able to understand, I think the National Health Mission is a proposition with a constitutional mandate, with a constitutional commitment to fulfill the mandate of Article 21 as incorporated in the fundamental rights and simultaneously realistic actualization of welfare state through catering to the cause of the fundamental right of extension of not only health care services, quality health care services to every citizen in the form of a guarantee, both through its arms of urban health mission and national rural health mission, but also a very, very bold and significant attempt at altering the social determinants of the society as a whole. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity. My prologue was to work out the entire polemics of national health mission as against constitutional mandate attributable and applicable to it. Thank you very much for patient listening. That was a very thought-provoking session, sir. And uh, it gave loads of insights uh, uh, for all of us with regard to rational and scope of National Health Mission. Sir, mainly emphasized on the cardinal parameters of right to health and right to education for attaining the welfare status. And sir, also highlighted various dimensions of uh, National Health Mission, that is provision of equitable, affordable and quality health care, which, which is also responsive uh, and accountable to the health care needs of the country and the community based on the principle of community ownership. So thank you very much, sir, for an enlightening uh, talk. Uh, I request all the participants to mute their microphones as well as post their questions in the chat box so we can take them at the end of the uh, all the sessions. Uh, without the session for the day, uh, which is on the topic objectives and components as well as achievements of uh, national health for this, uh, I would like to uh, welcome Professor O.P. Kalra, Honorable Vice Chancellor Sri Guru Govind Rai Centenary University, Gurugram, Haryana. Uh, sir is a Director Professor of Medicine uh, and Nephrologist, having a teaching experience of more than 40 years and is a renowned academic uh, administrator. Sir served as a Vice Chancellor at Pandit Sharma University of Health Sciences, Rohtak from 2015 to 2021, 
past president of association of indian health sciences universities sir has been a principal investigator and uh, investigator and co principal investigator for various research projects funded by the department of biotechnology department of science and technology and university grants commission he is a dedicated teacher and researcher having published a book monographs and more than 3 300 scientific papers and communications in various national and international journals of repute he has supervised md and phd thesis of more than 65 students uh, has been a guest speaker for various university and organizations in india and abroad during various conferences sir has been a recipient of several national and international awards fellowships and oration awards of which significant ones include dr b c roy national award in eminent medical teacher category awarded by the honorable president of india and state award by government of ncti of delhi he has held uh, senior pos positions in various prestigious academic bodies like chairman post graduate committee of medical council of india member of our, uh, undergraduate committee medical council of india and also member of national medical commission uh, sir has been a member of executive council academic council board of management board governing body of various universities in the country including shri balaji vidyapeeth uh, puducherry he has established hemodialysis centers at various government hospitals in delhi and haryana to provide a highly subsidized cost effective hemodialysis and radio diagnostic facilities under public private partnership to provide these facilities to the lower socio economic strata of the society uh, it's over to you sir too much thank you sir so can you share your slides or you want to so your audio is you're not able to get your audio okay. so we are not able to hear sir Hello, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. डॉक्टर कानन आई सेंट यू द्लाइड्स यस्टर्डे इवनिंग ईमेल कैन यू शेयर फ्रॉम योर एंड just give me a minute sir i'll i'll just get it across just give me a minute okay uh, so while you uh, share the screen with me uh, for the slides uh, uh, first of all uh, my deep regards to my very dear colleague and the vice chancellor of shri balaji vidyapeeth professor subhash parija my very dear colleague and my elder brother professor vedh prakash mishra Uh, who has made my task easier by giving such a wonderful uh, prelude to the discussions which are going to take place and faculty from the department of community medicine who have organized this program and the various participants uh, first of all i must uh, congratulate uh, the vice chancellor and the entire team in fact uh, this uh, program was to be held last month and we know that for very good reasons it was postponed because on that very day the university got the news that it had been accorded 
the NAC A++ status by the National Assessment and Accreditation Board. So first of all, congratulations to the university, our entire team and everybody associated with the university. My very sincere gratitude to Professor Rajagopal Ji, the Honorable Chancellor of the University, under whose dynamic leadership the university is really making strength to strength. Now, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, my task has been made much easier by Professor uh, Ved Prakash Mishra, who has really uh, uh, given a very nice prelude and preamble to the entire topic of National Health Mission. Uh, the, uh, can we share the slide, Dr. Kana? Yeah. Yes. The... Okay, so I'll be requesting you for change of the slide. Uh, yes, sir, we'll do that. We'll take, with you. we'll take it. We'll take it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'll be covering uh, about the components, the objectives, and the achievements of National Health Mission in my talk. Coming to the next slide. Uh, we know that during the last nearly two years, uh, the amount of discussion which has gone on, not only in India, but in the whole world, about the healthcare system in various countries, it has never happened before. And in fact, uh, everything in the country and the whole world was being discussed around COVID-19. Whatever research was being carried, carried out was COVID-related, whatever lifestyle changes occurred, they, those were also COVID related and we are still in the middle of everything. In a way, our lives have got COVIDized. But what has happened during this pandemic, for the first time, we felt quite miserable and we felt that how vulnerable we are and how vulnerable our healthcare system it is. And one of the main reasons that various people in the country have been debating is regarding the healthcare spending that we do in our country. I have been seeing that during the last uh, 15, 20 years, we have been talking that our G uh, budget should be increased to 2.5%. It has happened during the successive uh, five-year plans. It was being said that it will be raised to 2.5%, but that has not happened in the last almost 20 years. Even now, in the year 2019-20, it was just 1.29% of the GDP. The second point, which uh, Professor Ved Kashmisha has debated in great detail, that although he mentioned that there are various references through Article 21 of the Constitution of India and various other articles, that the central government as well as the state government they are committed to provide a guarantee to adequate or appropriate level of health to the country, uh, countrymen. But then when we look at the six fundamental rights, those which are enshrined in the constitution of our country, uh, that is the, uh, for example, the right to equality, right to freedom, right to against exploitation and right to freedom of religion. Among these six fundamental rights, we do not have mention of the right to health. But certainly through Article 21 and through other articles, there is an indirect reference that the countrymen, they have a right to their health. There is also a provision of right to life, but as was debated a few years ago, there is no <clears throat> right to die because <clears throat> when the issues pertaining to end of life care, euthanasia, etc., were being discussed. It was mentioned that we don't have the right to die because somebody who is suffering from terminal cancer, inexorable pain for the last several months to years, if he wants to die, there is no such provision. While there in many countries, there is a provision of right to die, particularly when a person is suffering from this kind of illness. The uh, as far as the uh, 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 inclusion of health uh, as a state subject or a central subject, this was also touched upon by Professor Mishra in detail. 
that health is primarily a state subject. Though, I mean, there are several schemes of the government of India and like national health mission. Through this, the budget is disbursed by the central government, but ultimately it is delivered by a mechanism through the state governments because in keeping with the federal structure of the uh, country, the health has to be delivered by the state government. There have been a lot of discussion and a lot of effort also that it should be included in the concurrent list. But that has not happened so far. It is mainly in the form of various schemes of the government of India, whether through Jan Ashadi scheme, through Amrit scheme, through Pradhan Mantri, Swastya Suraksha Yojana, or through the insurance scheme which was launched about two and a half years ago by the government of India. A wonderful scheme. So therefore, the health continues to be a state subject. And as we can see, there is a lot of disparity between the economic status of various states, particularly the states in the south, they are far well developed as far as their overall economies are concerned, as compared to certain states in the North India, particularly Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, where the health infrastructure and healthcare systems are weaker as compared to many of the southern states. So therefore, uh, the development of health facilities in any state obviously goes with the overall development in the state, though it is contributed to some extent by the central government also. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, in addition to the uh, constitutional provision of right to health, which has been discussed so far in great detail, uh, from time to time, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, the uh, role of various intergovernmental agencies uh, through the United Nations uh, for ensuring that the various governments in different countries they implement various schemes so that the right to health is ensured. And in fact, a lot of uh, uh, meetings have taken place and a few important ones. In 1977, the World Health Assembly had actually dictated that uh, the, it is the right of every individual and this must be attained by the year 2000. And a slogan was given by United uh, by the WHO that health for all by 2000, by the year 2000. And there were good 23 years to this. And the very next year in 1978, there was a very important meeting, landmark meeting, which took place at Alma Ata in the then USSR. And the declaration which came out from Alma Ata, it not only, first of all, reformed the definition of health, which means that the person should have complete health. Dr. Mishra made a mention of quality health mentioned by the National Health Mission. There it was mentioned as a complete health, which I think includes the quality as well. Uh, as far as the social health, physical health, social health, and mental health is concerned. And now some people are trying to add even spiritual health to it. And it is not only the absence of disease, which means health. So at Alma Ata, this definition was reaffirmed. In addition to that, it was also mentioned that it is a fundamental human right in the declaration to have a right to his health. And of course, it is the duty of every state government. It is the duty of every health and development workers and the whole world community to ensure that they protect and promote the health of every individual in this, uh, in this world. Now, there is gross inequality, we know, not only between the developed and the developing states, but also within the same country, as I have mentioned, that there are Bimaru states where the healthcare system is very weak, and therefore, it adversely affects the health of the individual. In Almata declaration, it was mainly uh, said that we have to achieve the target of health for all through improving the primary healthcare. Therefore, a lot of emphasis was given on the primary healthcare systems in the whole world in different countries. And a good time of 22 years was there, but despite those 22 years, we have not been able to achieve those targets which were initially set to be achieved in the Alma Ata Declaration. So therefore, subsequently, when the year 2000 actually came, then came the Millennium Development Goals. And it was felt that probably Millennium Development Goals is not the uh, appropriate word 
because the millennium has come and then after some time uh, uh, it may become redundant so therefore the terminology was replaced by sustainable development goals which i'll mention next slide please so with sustainable development goals uh, it was uh, next slide please uh, that we have to uh, uh, in the various sustainable development goals which have been enshrined in the initial document out of the 18 there are six or seven where there is a mention that uh, oblique reference to the health is there that the uh, various countries are mandated to ensure good quality of health to its people now coming to the topic of national health mission proper to see the background of this was that in the national health policy in 1983 initially and subsequently in 2002 and then uh, after that actually now we have the uh, last policy which came in 2015 also in 2002 policy it was mentioned that we have to ensure through various central mechanisms by the central government to ensure that the health of the people is improved particularly it was said that the health of the people in the rural areas is very weak therefore when it was first launched in the year 2005 it mainly came up in its earlier avatar as national rural health mission and the focus was largely on the implementing various health system in the rural areas subsequently it was felt that even the urban areas the health is poor because in rural areas though we have a structured system of community health centers but in the urban areas where there we have the district hospitals but for most of the people living in the cities there is no structured health system and many of them they have to go to private hospitals thereby resulting in lot of out of pocket expenditure it was felt that particularly in the cities the health of the people living in the urban slums is very poor and it is much more miserable than even the worst villages therefore it was felt that we need to do something about the urban areas also and in fact between the years 1961 to 2001 the rural population some spelling mistake is there the rural population had doubled however the urban population had grown nearly 3.6 times in fact the urban population growth is suffering from 2 3 4 5 syndrome it this syndrome indicates that whereas during the last decade or so the population in india grew two times the population in uh, urban areas grew three times and the population in mega cities has grown four times while the population in the urban slums has grown almost five times so you can imagine the plight of the people who are living in the urban slums where the population is growing at such a fast rate average annual growth rate uh, in the urban areas particularly in the slums is 5 to 6% the number of cities with million plus population in the year 2001 was just 35 while in 2021 it has grown to 75 therefore it was felt that in view of the plight of the people living in the cities particularly the urban slums there is need to have national urban health mission also so in 2013 it was started and then both the national urban health mission as well as national rural health mission were considered as two arms of the national health mission and the new uh, terminology was coined at that time next next one please so next slide please so there are two main constituents of it national urban and national rural health mission of the nhm what are the main components the main components of national health mission are first is strengthening of the health systems in the rural as well as urban areas and there is focus on certain areas one is the rmnch plus a services that is reproductive maternal neonatal child and adolescent health services and communicable and non communicable diseases through various national programs which are running in the entire country the most important aim of nhm is achievement of universal access to equitable affordable and quality healthcare services which is accountable and responsive to the people's needs next one please now uh, as it's a federal structure so the central government supports the states not only in creation of 
additional health facilities or augmenting the existing facilities as far as the infrastructural gaps are concerned, but also providing health services in a free range pertaining to maternal health, child health, adolescent health, family planning, universal immunization program, and also helping eradication or elimination of various infectious as well as non-communicable diseases. Next one, please. So the various components of National Health Mission, broadly they include, one is the National Health Mission, particularly for uh, reproductive and child health services, then urban health, then communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and infrastructure augmentation and maintenance of it. And then, of course, through various programs, which I'll be coming a little later, national programs. Next one, please. Now, in this uh, in various services, that is reproductive, maternal, and neonatal child health services, here the aim is to improve the health of the mothers and their children, as well as ensuring that their survivals are vital to the achievement of national health goals. Because if our children are healthy, if our mothers are healthy, then only we can hope to be a healthy country. Next one, please. So, uh, in addition to providing infrastructural support, uh, the uh, central government also provides various guidelines, SOPs, the clinical practice guidelines from time to time, and various protocols and administrative and management processes, so that these can help various states for implementing uh, the various facets of national health mission. In addition to this, they also provide skill sets and also training opportunities to the people working in various areas. And of course, one of the important uh, aspect is creation of a health hospital management society or a Rogi Kalyan Samiti. Next one, please. Which oversees the functioning of the system. Next one, please. Now, as far as non-communicable diseases are concerned, uh, this is a very important area because various national programs are running in the country. Next one, as you can see from this, that we have national tobacco control program, palliative control program, oral health program, and uh, tuberculosis control program, and also uh, for uh, various non-communicable diseases also now the program is there for cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. All these national programs are there and the budget for these programs comes through the National Health Mission. Next one. Now, what are the various initiatives for community participation which have been done under the National Health Mission? Next one, please. Uh, this is through starting of various Rogi Kalyan Samitis and already more than 30,000 Rogi Kalyan Samitis have been established in various district hospitals, sub-district hospitals, community health centers, and primary health centers. Next one. The most important link, uh, as far as the entire chain of healthcare providers are concerned, in this regard, is to ASHAs, that is accredited social health activists, and nearly 10 lakh ASHAs are in place in various uh, urban and rural areas in the country, and they are serving as facilitators, mobilizers, and providers of community level care. And ASHA, in fact, is the first point of contact uh, with the community as far as these various programs are concerned. Uh, we actually had done some studies also by empowering ASHAs, by giving them various devices such as tablets or through mobile phones, whereby they can more effectively implement various national health programs and have direct communication uh, of the community with the doctors sitting in the district headquarters. And this has been found to be very effective. Next one, please. Now, what are the various objectives of National Health Mission? Next. Now, there are various objectives, uh, some quantitative or measurable targets have been set, which I'll come to in the next few slides uh, with regard to the child and maternal mortality rate, under five mortality rate, <clears throat> how much access to the primary health care we are able to provide. And then we have to mainstream the Ayush people and also promote healthy lifestyles. These are the most important um, uh, objectives of the National Health Mission. Next one. We, uh, we aim that we should be able to bring the maternal mortality rate 
to less than one per thousand live births, infant mortality rate to less than 25 per thousand live births, and to, uh, fertility rate uh, also is to be brought down. So there are various targets. I will not go into uh, uh, minor details of all these targets. Next one, please. Similarly, uh, the one of the other important uh, targets is to bring down the out-of-pocket expenditure because we know that since the total budget, as I mentioned earlier, even in the year 2019-20, in the country was just 1.3 percent of the GDP. Whereas, if we look at the budget of the other countries in Europe, it is about seven, eight to nine percent of the GDP. In USA, it's about 17 percent, while we are spending even now less than 1.3 percent. So what happens is that many of the people, they are then under uh, no option, but they have to spend money for their own health care when it comes to uh, some critical illnesses. And this results in what is called catastrophic expenditure on health care. And this pushes the poor people further down below the poverty line. Now, this is one of the main missions of the National Health Mission uh, that we have to prevent or decrease the out-of-pocket uh, expenditure by at least 25% or so. So uh, it is with this regard that Ayushman Bharat scheme of Government of India was started, particularly for those people who are living below the poverty line as per the census of 2011. And here it is planned to cover nearly 55 crore people or 10 crore families uh, who will be benefited by this scheme I think this is a wonderful scheme. It is the largest mass insurance scheme initiated by any government in the world. Next one, please. Now, there have been several achievements of National Health Mission as far as these parameters are concerned. Next one, though we have not yet at this stage been able to achieve uh, the targets which have been initially set, but certainly we are progressing in that direction. And it is expected that within the next few years, we will definitely be achieving our aim, what was initially said, that to ensure quality health care for all the citizens so that they are able to lead a socially and economically productive life. Next one, please. Uh, I mean, these are certain other figures that how the National Tobacco Control Program uh, has been able implemented in various districts and tobacco use has gone down. The National Tobacco Association quit line services have been launched and in this direction, a lot of work has already been done. Certainly, uh, the uh, percentage of people smoking has not increased to that extent what was happening until about 10 years ago. Next one, please. Similarly, uh, one of the other parameters is uh, that how many deliveries are taking place in the institutions. Because earlier on, what was happening, nearly 60% deliveries, they were taking place at home 20, 30 years ago. But when the deliveries take place at home, there are more chances that complications will take place. The maternal mortality, infant mortality, they are likely to be very high. Now, uh, institutional delivery has increased from 47% to nearly 80% at the moment. Next one, please. And there has been lot of improvement in the various other parameters also, such as maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate, under five mortality rate as well, certainly. Next one, please. Uh, and of course, the overall network of various public health facilities at the central level, at the, at the rural level, at the urban level, all these have increased significantly. Next one. And of course, there is focus on certain populations which are uh, lagging behind as far as various health indicators are concerned. One is the tribal populations, urban poor, and then those living in the aspirational districts. That is those which are very remote and very poor districts. Uh, there, there is a greater thirst of the National Health Mission. Next one. Uh, in 2005, there was no provision of any national ambulance services, but now there are nearly 21,000 emergency response service vehicles are there. And in addition to that, various other, various states have started their own uh, ambulance services 
uh, which are working very effectively, particularly in Tamil Nadu, in Andhra Pradesh, in Delhi also, these services have been started. Next one. In addition to that, the National Health Mission has also been successful in increasing the uh, HR, uh, uh, whether it is doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, and as I told earlier, nearly 10 lakh ASHAs, they are in force working in various urban and rural areas in the country. Next. And of course, uh, the out-of-pocket expenditure, it is expected that with the passage of time, from current out-of-pocket expenditure of nearly 70%, it should come down to nearly 40% or so. Next one. And for this, uh, various Janoshadi Kendras have been opened. Uh, for example, in Janoshadi Kendra, a particular medicine which is available for 80 rupees in the market, it may be available over there in just about 15, 20 rupees only. So there is a discount of nearly 20% uh, uh, to nearly 70-80% uh, at the Janoshadi Kendras. In addition to that, a list of essential medicine has been prepared at the central level which is actually a mandatory requirement in various uh, government institutions. They have to have a stock of these things. And of course, essential diagnostic list is also there. And it is also the, uh, the uh, responsibility of various government institutions to ensure that those facilities are provided. So uh, last slide, please. So, I mean, ever since the National Rural Health Mission was started in 2005 and Urban Mission was started in 2013. We have progressed a lot, but certainly we are still away from achieving uh, our various healthcare parameters. Uh, and also, uh, one of the main, main factors in this is that the budgetary provision, which is still low, that needs to be augmented at the central government level, at the uh, state government level, we need to ensure that once the budget is increased, once the insurance scheme is implemented in full form for all the deserving citizens or entitled citizens of the country, uh, after that only the out-of-pocket expenditure can come down and the services can reach out to each and every person. And our various uh, healthcare indicators, uh, that is the IMR, MMR, under five mortality, all these parameters can improve. So there has been a progress, but still there is a need to work on this direction in times to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was quite an informative session. Uh, at the outset, uh, Pratik, sir. Pratik, ma'am, one second. Uh, yes. So, so thank you, thank you, Kalraji, sir, uh, for giving an amazing talk. And uh, so here we would like to state that uh, mm, the. No, our uh, due to um, some unavoidable reasons, our honourable vice chancellor sir was not is not able to join to give the third talk. Sir, I will revert back to you in a private chat, and I will revert back to you, Mishra ji sir and Kalra ji sir about that. And uh, we would like to and we would like to say uh, actually this is a very big crowd which is actually attending this very important talk. We have got faculties, we have got students from all the institutes, that is from the Sati Sai Medical College, from, Go, from Atma Gandhi Medical College, from the uh, Kasturi Gandhi Nursing College, and the Allied Health Services. In fact, one full classroom of 150 students are actually watching this program because we felt it is a very important talk. So we would like to thank all the principals and the deans for allowing their students to attend in spite of them being a, and all of them have joined through online. So I request Pratik ma'am to give a small gist of what had happened, and also to speak something about the government initiatives about that. Pratik, ma'am. Ma'am, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, Kalra, sir, has already highlighted many of the government uh, initiatives, uh, like uh, RNNCH plus A initiative, which is there for uh, anti-little women, as well as for newborn children, for adolescent girls. Uh, and uh, sir has also spoken about uh, various community participation initiatives which have been launched under uh, National Health Mission, that is Rogi Kalyan Samiti, uh, introduction of ASHA workers in, at, as village level uh, health workers who actually act as a bridge between the community and the healthcare system. 
and sir also highlighted uh, various initiatives which are actually uh, implemented even in health sciences universities that is uh, janani suraksha yojana which is a, a scheme by the government of india which provides financial incentives uh, for antenatal women who deliver in government hospitals as well as uh, uh, institutes uh, private institutes which are accredited uh, with the government so in that uh, as per that uh, all the uh, antenatal women who deliver they are uh, given some financial incentives in order to promote institutional deliveries Uh, similarly uh, there are different ways in which uh, other uh, health sciences institutes can be involved actively in implementation of these various initiatives which were highlighted uh, by the uh, both our eminent speakers uh, by provision of uh, not only primary level of care in the field practice areas of uh, medical colleges but also through outreach uh, services through uh, camps especially for vulnerable populations or hard to reach areas like uh, tribal population or fisherman community and also through me mobile medical units and uh, provision of telemedicine so that uh, specialist services can be provided where it is uh, actually not uh, physically present Uh, another place where health sciences universities uh, offer uh, important role is uh, referral services from their outreach health centers or peripheral centers uh, those uh, uh, patients who require a secondary or tertiary level of care are provided uh, appropriate referral services so that uh, the advanced form of care and surgical facilities are provided to them uh, at the tertiary level uh, care centers Uh, apart from that there are some of the initiatives which are there uh, in uh, national health mission that is uh, rashtriya bal swasthya karyakram wherein uh, there is screening of newborns for various uh, de developmental defects and uh, delays so those are the things which are done to screen at an early age for uh, the newborn as well as for children so that uh, if any defect or anything is found they can be managed at an early age so that they lead a better life uh, later on so uh, as as sir highlighted that there are many uh, target indicators given for you know uh, the national health mission which we have not we are making a progress but we have not been able to reach uh, or achieve the target as such so uh, but uh, it requires a collaborative manner with regard to different uh, sectors intersectoral coordination together so that we reach uh, the ultimate objective of national health mission is accomplished and in order to do that a lot of hard work has to be done not only by the government sector but also with the public private partnership even private institutes and private uh, universities can pitch in together along with government uh, to make uh, the required progress to attain this uh, the ultimate aim of universal health coverage for the entire uh, country so that's what for con to conclude i would like to say that we all should join our hands together and work in a collaborative manner both government set up as well as the private institutes which are there uh, looking after healthcare to improve the various health indicators uh, not only uh, the direct health indicators but indirect health indicators that is the social nutritional or sanitation based indicators which indirectly impact adversely our uh, health so <clears throat> sir if there is any uh, questions in the chat can we take those the floor is open for questions if somebody if would somebody would like uh, to dr kannan yes sir am i audible yes sir you are audible sir can i make a point yes sir i want to grab this opportunity because we have two erudite speakers one is uh, professor veer Pr prakash mishra who is my role model and the mentor i can say uh, and of, also dr kalra who is another person these are the stalwarts and we are very lucky to talk about a very important issue if i have to give my impression because i am not an expert neither in community medicine nor in public health i am an educationist but uh, my simple understanding is that two issues are very important one is the financial or budgeting issues which dr kalra mentioned uh, we have totally unacceptable uh, budget for health which has to be looked into so i will ask him the question uh, to tell what can be done uh, can we make a collective voice to to do this uh, important change which is required the second one which was pointed out by dr vedh prakash mishra he talked about you know uh, the federal structure 
you know, I think the whole problem is communication gap. If I were to put in one word, why we are not going ahead is because of the communication gap. The first communication gap is the federal structure, the relation between center and the states, the political parties involved. So this is the first complex. The second issue is within the, the profession itself, we have you know, the health profession, consists of medical, dentistry, nursing, allied health sciences, and besides Ayush, which is a very important element. And many times we don't connect to, to these systems and they are considered as competitors rather than the important players to work together. Then the regulators are different. If you look at the regulators, where is the opportunity for the regulator to sit together and to talk about interprofessional education, which is very important. I have often heard Professor Mishra talking about the importance of this. Because unless we make a connection with the other departments, other professions, perhaps we are not going to win the uh, important game of health because health is a collective agenda. So there, there's another communication problem. The, so then again, the within the health sciences universities itself, there are departments, there are faculties, etc. So I think different layers are involved complex systems are involved. We have to win over by breaking the silos. So I want little guidance or suggestions or whatever it is from Ved Prakash Mishra sir, how we can bridge the gap, this communication gap. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, I hope my question makes uh, sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adkoli. Uh, very pertinent question raised. I am answering my part of Erina. Rest I will be leaving it to my brother, Dr. Kalra. It is true that the constitutional fathers, founding fathers made the federal structure very consciously. Basically because if you look at Article 1 of the Constitution itself, which defines what India is, and perhaps that article speaks everything. It says, quote, India is a union of states, unquote. So the importance of states as a unit of development has been the edifice of the frame of the constitution. And that is the reason why state list, central list, and concurrent list as schedules in terms of the demarcation of authority and power came into being. I'm not going into the historical, political, reasons there to justification or otherwise. But accepting the constitutional position as it is, I am only wanting to bring one important aspect to the knowledge of all concerned. What was the compulsion for the government to convert higher education into concurrent list, bringing it out from the central list in a similar way? I think there was a very strong sentiment, which rightly was echoed by Dr. Kalra in, in his uh, depiction, that perhaps taking into consideration the need and the relevance, it would be appropriate and it would be in the fitness of things that health, instead of being put across as a state subject, it is included in the concurrent list. Why I am saying so? Is it not a fact that medical education as a whole, and when I say medical education, the health professional education as a whole, it is not in state list. It is in concurrent list. 1979 amendment has put that in the concurrent list. Why we take half-hearted approach? Of course, it's a political issue and it has to be viewed by the by, by, by politically. But whatever little I'm in a position to understand, the, the dichotomy is that health professional education is in concurrent list, but Health continues to be in the state list, perhaps in a way is mismatch. The advantage of the concurrent list is that the frames are workable at both the ends, state as well as center. And the guidelines which are prescribed by the center, well, they have got mandatory and binding effect. Health is one such area where any dichotomy, you are only talking, Dr. Adkoli, of the communication gap. I am talking of the structural dichotomy. That structural dichotomy is, cost, is causing us very heavily. It is not the personalized communications that can be evoked in terms of cooperation and coordination. It's a fundamental structural change which has to be thought of. And until and unless we approach that, we talk of intersectoral congruence. 
how exactly that congruence is to be worked out when the authorities and jurisdictions they are not in a position to put it across in the same building director higher education director medical education and director public health i i don't believe that there has been any coordination at the level of any state at any point of time the reasons are we have not been able to work out structural changes which are mandated on that count and therefore my suggestion would be we should work out a comprehensive document as to what are the structural changes which are mandated for the purpose of streamlining the entire setup of health extension through healthcare delivery vis-a-vis -vis generation of trade health manpower in terms of the educational institution there too a classical example which i will put across to you is continuing medical education or continuing professional update which turns out to be a hallmark of capacity building for healthcare delivery extension it has not been provided in the educational system at all in any way and that is exactly a great high test so it is not only the issue of healthcare the issue of health sciences universities the issue of regulator i think national education policy 2020 document has indicated definitely guidelines on to this particular perspective but as the action plan there on as yet is not come into public domain therefore it is difficult to comment where as to whether the indicative dimensions which have been indicated therein of unitary of putting the things in a unitary structure under a common um, umbrella whether that will be materializing in the action plan it is only upon the action plan conceived by the government coming into public domain perhaps you and me would be in a position to comment but otherwise i think people like us who have definitely put our lifetime into these situations based on our experiences and bottlenecks it is imperative that we we try to generate a white paper on status of health in terms of the present modality and the suggested structural modality what difference and what change it would make and put it across try to put it across and go in for opinion building and last all these things do not materialize in including in terms of the issue of funding as i told in the beginning itself 6% of the gdp was contemplated to be the funding which was mandated in 1952 over a period of time name any five year plan it has never touched 6% leave aside it has never crossed even the 50% demarcating point 3.06% of the gdp was the uppermost limit which was touched otherwise we have never been able to touch what was recommended as public funding for health in the year 1952 on the contrary public funding in the domain of health and education has shrunk the a country which is stated to be poor is required to be stated to investing highest out of pocket expenditure expenses in the domain of public health in the domain of healthcare expenditure is a matter of reality so these are the topsy turvy situations which we are all experiencing personal level situations will work only topically but structural changes are the need of the hour and they need to be thought of to be put across to the corridors of power for their proper Uh, utilization use and maybe political will uh, is needed on that count and lastly which i would like to put across has any time health has been has been a electoral issue in this country see the developed economies and developed world it is the health sector which is the prime issue of the president of america is elected on the policies which are going to entail the health scenario in this country of yours and mine health is still a foregone conclusion which has always been in the back burner and never a political issue in any election including of a gram panchayat leave aside you and me constituting a lok sabha on that issue thank you very much thank you sir let us hope some good days will come <laughs> now, i'll just uh, uh, take the thread from professor vedant prakash and uh, um, add from my side uh he's already beautifully told that in 1952 the provision of 6% of the gdp was made and i was looking at the budget sanction during various five year plans in fact uh, if we look at the budget allocation during uh, the various five year plan there has been a successive decline rather than increase and we don't see any immediate hope though it has been mentioned that we probably will touch 2.5% which also appears to be a tall order the uh, unfortunate part is that two most important building blocks for any nation that is 
the health of the people and the educational status of the people these are the two most important building blocks which ultimately uh, bring up a healthy educated countrymen and these are not revenue generating uh, departments in the short term at least in the long term of course if a person is healthy he is able to produce uh, be more productive socially economically and an educated person also but then in the short term these don't bring up a result immediately therefore that is the reason probably why the governments because they look at short term rather even when election is there what is delivered one week before that or one day before that that is what counts the most so therefore that is the plight of the people that we are not able to get what we should get for our countrymen as a right we talk so much about right to health but it has not happened so far the other thing is that uh, as far as Uh, the intersectoral and participation of all people beyond the people directly involved in the healthcare system actually if we look at the slogan initially which was devised the health for all by 2000 the complete slogan was health for all by 2000 and all for health that means everybody has to work for health right from who united nations who multilateral agency bilateral agency all healthcare workers doctors right up to ashas when everybody is working then only we can achieve those things certainly the political patronage has to be there you see when who when our country devised the dots program the first and the foremost thing which was mentioned in this was the political will so unless and until there is a political will for providing success to that program it will not happen so therefore it is very important that unless and until there is political patronage which will ensure budgetary provision uh, then only probably uh, things can happen last two years as i mentioned we have been talking so much about covid and the healthcare system let's see what happens in the month of february uh, what amount of budget is allocated by the central government Uh, if there is an improvement, uh, I think uh, I will not be surprised if there is improvement. But certainly, I don't feel that it is going to touch even three uh, percent. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. If if no other questions are there, ma'am, you can. Yeah. Okay. So. i would like uh, to thank both of our uh, resource persons for sparing their time out of their busy schedules and enlightening us about the national health mission i also thank participants for their active participation and uh, also thank our it team finally i thank the sbv webinar team for working tirelessly uh, and also for selecting me as a moderator for today's session and enlightening myself in the process thank you everybody uh, stay healthy and stay safe Thank, thank you. you thank you very much we'd like thank to you. thank mishra ji and kalra ji for joining yes. us in spite of their busy schedule we request everybody to stay safe and stay healthy thank you same from our side same from our side